Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yong Cheng. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be able to speak uh, in front of the Chinese audience. It's uh, the second time in my life and uh, the second time in the last two weeks that I'm uh, speaking for uh, audiences in China. And uh, two weeks ago, it was for Huawei uh, company that I gave a lecture. So uh, uh, the subject of my, in my talk, I will try to uh, introduce the subject I'm involved with for the last uh, several years and uh, somehow uh, illuminate the origins of this, uh, of this uh, approach to proof theory and somehow the main problems and goals. And uh, so it will be, uh, the results I will be talking about will not be really very fresh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, exposition of these ideas uh, evolves and becomes uh, better and, and better in my opinion. So I will try to present it now. Okay, uh, so um, let me begin by recalling that uh, uh, mathematical logic uh, one aspect of mathematical logic deals with uh, the study of formal systems that are sufficiently strong to formalize uh, significant parts of mathematics. And in the course of uh, let's say the last uh, uh, 100 years and more, uh, there were several such systems, standard systems uh, developed in mathematical logic. Among them, uh, those three uh, particularly important ones uh, uh, that deal with, uh, firstly, uh, so-called finitary mathematics or mathematics of finite objects, or uh, as every finite object can be coded by a number. So this is uh, usually formulated as a theory of arithmetic, it's called piano arithmetic. So that's the semantic theory of natural numbers uh, in the language with plus and times. Uh, then there is uh, uh, the, the second order arithmetic, the system which was uh, developed to formalize analysis or the theory of real numbers and functions. So uh, this is a uh, extension of piano arithmetic by variables for sets of natural numbers. And in second order, full second order arithmetic, we assume the schemata of uh, full induction, induction for formulas expressible in this language for numbers and comprehension formation of sets or ar by arbitrary properties expressed in this language. And then there is this uh, uh, well-known Sermelo Frankel, set C, ZFC with the axiom of choice that uh, is believed to formalize practically all conventional mathematics. It is based on the abstract concept of set and members. So these are the three main, so to say, uh, cornerstones of, uh, uh, of uh, formalized mathematics as seen in mathematical logic. And of course, uh, uh, as a side remark, uh, uh, these formal systems are now uh, uh, being developed as uh, purely theoretical devices. Now they are uh, materialized in some sense in various automatic and interactive theorem programs such as Koch, Isabel, and others. Okay, uh, so what we see that uh, logical theories such as those above, uh, they greatly differ. They differ in several aspects. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, they firstly differ in the expressivity of their language or uh, as one calls it in logic, richness. So uh, rich la languages can express more, whereas weaker or poor languages can express less. So the language of uh, set theory is richer than the language of arithmetic and even than the language of set theory. Uh, however, uh, being able to express more than that 
your logical system uh, is able to prove more things. So, uh, this property of uh, being able to prove more is called the strength of uh, a logical system. So, uh, essentially, it corresponds to the amount of axioms or the number of assumed principles or axioms for a system. And uh, theories, even in the same language, can differ in strengths. But, then, but uh, then there are other parameters that are relevant for the study of systematic theories, especially in connection with the systematic For example, uh, uh, the speed of proofs, the length of proofs, uh, the particular deductive mechanism, which rules are used and, and how. So all this, uh, uh, the study of these aspects and uh, comparison of various systems is the main subject of, uh, of proof theory. It's a theory which uh, studies semiotic systems and proofs in them. So uh, for many years, uh, since the work, essentially the work of Gensen, proof theories have been looking for ways to compare and measure proof theoretic strengths somehow to relate to each other, to one another, different formal systems and to develop some kind of uh, quantitative, perhaps, measures of their, of their strengths. And uh, this topic uh, is called ordinal analysis because uh, mostly people concentrated on, on various measures of strengths related to uh, the notion of ordinals. So ordinals or well orderings are the objects uh, uh, that are uh, that can be associated to formal systems to measure their strengths. Okay. Now, uh, uh, in my talk, I will uh, begin by let's say saying that <clears throat> what kind of uh, uh, by uh, uh, make an, uh, another remark that uh, it's not only the uh, so the role of ordinals is not only to, to compare the strengths of theories, although that's perhaps the, the most straightforward uh, use of them. So usually uh, the way of analyzing a formal system yields more interesting information about it. So uh, for one such uh, uh, piece of information that uh, people were interested in are, um, for example, so-called provably recursive functions, provably prove computable functions that can be proved to be total in a given system and closely related uh, uh, subject of uh, explicit combinatorial independent uh, principles uh, that can be found or formulated for one or another system. So these are Tightly, uh, uh, these are the topics tightly connected to the general question of analysis of, uh, of a given formal system. And what it can deliver, uh, I will demonstrate by this, uh, by the worm, by the so-called worm principle, uh, which is a representative of a larger, much larger family of combinatorial results that can be proved to be independent of uh, piano arithmetic in this case. It all started with the work of Paris, Kirby, and Harrington in the late 70s, uh, who found the first and very interesting examples of such, of such principles. Uh, the particular example that I'm talking about here was found by Hamana and Okada in 1997, and I uh, discovered it independently, but later in 2002. So it deals with the particular uh, game to be played on words in the alphabet of natural numbers. So suppose, uh, so we consider finite strings of uh, natural numbers, which we call words or worms sometimes. Um, so words will be denoted by Greek letters such as alpha, and we can say that define the notion of a word alpha to be higher than n, than the natural number n, if each letter of alpha exceeds n. And then given any word alpha, we can generate uh, the following sequence um, of words according to the following rules. So uh, 
first we start with the word alpha. <clears throat> and once alpha k is defined, we define the word alpha k plus one uh, by the following uh, rules. Firstly, if alpha k begins with zero, then alpha k plus one is obtained by deleting this uh, zero, the head of the long worm alpha k that we consider. And then uh, if alpha k begins with any letter larger than zero, letter n plus one, then we should do the following. We should find the longest uh, possibly empty prefix beta zero of uh, the word beta. Can you see my pointer as I'm pointing it? Yes? Yes, I can, we, uh -huh. we can see. Okay, very good. So we can, uh, we should find the longest possibly empty prefix beta zero of beta, which is higher than n. So we read our word alpha k from left to right and stop at the, at the very first letter, which is uh, smaller, which is uh, at most n. Uh, assume this uh, word beta is written as beta zero gamma. And then uh, the next word alpha k plus one will be uh, we'll look as follows. So we take uh, lower the head n plus one by one. So we obtain the word n beta zero. We iterated k plus two times and applied. And then uh, uh, this prefix will be followed by gamma. So in some sense, uh, beta z n plus one beta zero will be replaced by this long expression of k fold, uh, k plus two fold iteration. So these are the simple rules of the game. And uh, then uh, an example that I would like to demonstrate is this one. So suppose we start with the word alpha zero, which is this one. Uh, then uh, what will be the next stage? Uh, so here the head is uh, this, just this letter one. Uh, the prefix uh, that I'm talking about will be the two letters before the zero, which is the first letter below one. And then we should repeat it two times uh, because it's the first stage, first step of our game. So we obtain the word zero three zero three zero two two. So the rule number two was applied to alpha zero. Uh, then we see that the new word begins with zero. So at the next stage, this zero disappears, is deleted. Um, and then again, we are in the situation that the word begins with three. Uh, then what should uh, we do? So this prefix that we uh, talked about is now em empty because um, the next letter is just zero. So three is, uh, is big becomes two and it is repeated now four times because now we are at the age three of the game. Okay, and so on and so on. So we obtain the word, similarly, we obtain the word alpha four where we have uh, one, two, two, two repeated five times uh, and alpha five where we have this whole prefix uh, repeated six times and so on and so on. It appears initially that this word is growing and growing. However, uh, the result is uh, uh, <clears throat> in fact that the following statement called WP, warm principle, is uh, uh, true, however, unprovable in piano arithmetic. So, uh, in fact, for each word alpha, the sequence alpha k terminates in an empty word. So uh, the process that I have just described is always finite. And uh, uh, this is a statement of the warm principle. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the most, the most interesting aspect of it is not so much that it actually is true, but rather that it is not provable in piano arithmetic or as I mentioned, by finitary means. So any proof of, uh, of this uh, mathematical statement, WP must, uh, according to the theorem, uh, 
uh, uh, use methods not formalizable in piano arithmetic. And that's already a pretty significant uh, statement because uh, we know that a great many mathematical results, especially de dealing with finite combinatorics, uh, they all are formalizable in PA, in contrast to this one. So there are, we may ask what are the reasons for this WP uh, to be true. As far as I know, there are three different arguments for, uh, for it. They are not difficult, I will omit it. The most traditional kind of argument would, would be to assign ordinals to uh, to these objects, to worms, and check uh, that the rules of the game, they lead to the decreasing of these ordinals. Uh, and as we know that there are no descending infinite descending sequences of ordinals, that, uh, that would mean that uh, WP would be, would be in fact true. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, moreover, we can say that uh, WP is a kind of uh, Gödelian uh, type of statement in the sense that it is equivalent to the so-called sigma one reflection principle for piano arithmetic. I will explain later in my talk what it means. Uh, so far you need not uh, be aware of it, but uh, that's, uh, uh, you can just, uh, for now it will be sufficient to to know that this is a kind of statement generalizing Gödel's consistency assertion for PA uh, and independent sentence for piano arithmetic. Uh, but the third point is uh, more uh, uh, is uh, can be easily understood uh, right now is that uh, uh, we can associate with this statement the following function: the function f of alpha. Uh, that associates with the worm or with the word alpha uh, the number of steps of the game until the word alpha, uh, the word, uh, alpha n becomes m. So the f of alpha is the minimal natural number n such that alpha n is empty. In other words, the length of this game. Uh, the third statement uh, uh, states that uh, this function f of alpha exceeds any any function, any computable function that can be proved to be everywhere defined in piano arithmetic. So that's the uh, essential property of this uh, of this construction. So now it, it is interesting that uh, these statements appear appeared, at least in my work, not, not as an ad hoc statement, but uh, rather as a result of uh, abstraction from certain properties of, uh, of, of reflection principles mentioned so far, certain properties of piano arithmetic uh, that came out of its analysis, way of analyzing piano arithmetic. And I would like to explain some ideas behind it. So it's not uh, accidental that this uh, uh, statement holds, but rather it is a kind of uh, representation of certain properties of piano arithmetic that uh, of certain combinatorial, if you like, aspects of, of, of the proof theory of piano arithmetic. Okay, uh, so that's a kind of illustrative example, but let me now add a few more slides of uh, background on arithmetic because it plays will play a uh, role in what follows. So what is uh, piano arithmetic? So we work uh, in the first order language, or first, order, first order logic, where the language consists of uh, two constants, zero and one uh, functions, plus and times, and uh, the third function, two to the x, exponentiation as well as predicate uh, less than and equal. So this is uh, the standard signature of formal arithmetic, standard for convenience by exponentiation, which allows us to uh, not to bother much about uh, 
to, uh, let's say, overcome initial difficulties of coding. So, uh, uh, this language has an obvious interpretation in the standard model in natural numbers, and that's the standard model of Rift. Now, uh, we introduce the following notions. Uh, bounded quantifiers are uh, quantifier occurrences in logical formulas uh, in this language that are bounded. In other words, uh, quantifiers restricted uh, by terms. So uh, if uh, a quantifier for all x occurs on, in the context for all x smaller than t, where t is a term expression involving plus times and explanation, then uh, this is a bounded universal quantifier and there is x smaller than t, where t is a term, then this is a bounded existential quantifier. Uh, formulas in which all quantifiers are bounded are called uh, also bounded formulas, uh, sometimes delta naught of X formulas. So these are uh, in some sense, uh, very simple uh, kind of formulas expressing all properties expressible by such formulas are designable, right? So one can check whether the quantifier holds is true or not true. Uh, using finitely many steps. One first computes the value of the term t and then checks whether the quantifier is, uh, whether uh, the property holds for all x smaller than that number or not. This is decidable. So uh, nothing uncomputable is expressible by, by bounded formulas. And um, elementary arithmetic is, uh, the formal system where, which has certain standard minimal set of basic axioms defining plus times exponentiation on all symbols in our signature, plus the induction schema for bounded formulas. So that's called elementary arithmetic. Whereas in piano arithmetic, we allow arbitrary formulas expressible in our language, also with unbounded quantifiers together with the in, in the induction formula. So the arithmetic can be seen as an extension of AA with full induction, where phi is any formula possible with, possibly with parameters. So that's uh, two basic formal systems that we uh, deal with. Um, uh, and we also need a few, uh, to say a few words about uh, formulas with unbounded quantifiers. As we all know, uh, every logical formula in first order logic can be brought uh, to an equivalent Prenex normal form. That is uh, a logical form where all quantifiers uh, are um, say outside. Uh, so it begins with a prefix of unbounded quantifiers followed by, by some formula, which can even be assumed quantifier free. In the language of formal arithmetic, one considers the following class. So uh, as a minimal class of formulas, which is denoted sigma zero or pi zero or delta zero one, is considered bounded formulas. And then adding quantifiers, unbounded quantifiers on top of bounded formulas. Uh, yields classes of sigma n formulas or pi n formulas. So sigma n formulas are formulas where this block of, uh, there is a block of n alternating quantifiers followed by a bounded formula. Pi n formulas are those where there is a block of uh, also n alternating quantifiers by, but in a different order, for all exist, for all exist, followed by a bounded formula. So these are the formulas of the so-called arithmetic hierarchy. And the most important fact about it, uh, both practically and uh, philosophically, is that predicates definable or sets definable by sigma one formulas are precisely exactly the recursively or computably enumerable sets of natural numbers. So a set is computably enumerable even only if uh, it is definable by a sigma one formula. 
So that shows, uh, since we all know uh, that computably enumerable sets are as basic as computable functions, computable partial function, so that's another reincarnation of the notion of computability in the context of arithmetic. And this is a very robust and important class uh, of, uh, of sets or predicates or, or of function. So are sigma one formulas. So sigma one formulas in the standard model are essentially are essentially uh, programs to compute something. Uh, they are equivalent to Turing machines in the context of arithmetic. So, uh, therefore, it's no surprise uh, that the notions of sigma one and pi one, and uh, of course related classes sigma n and pi n, play a very big role in the study of, of piano arithmetic. So, uh, one can restrict induction schema in PA to, to those classes sigma n, and then one obtains the hierarchy of extensions of elementary arithmetic, usually denoted I sigma n. So this I sigma n is the uh, elementary ar arithmetic plus induction schema for just sigma n formulas. So if one is thinking about induction for innumerable, predicates, uh, then um, this system is called I sigma one, perhaps the most uh, popular. All such systems are known to uh, form a strictly increasing chain. So the union of this chain will be piano arithmetic itself, because as I said, every formula is equivalent to the sigma n formula, so uh, logically, so, um, Full induction is equivalent to sigma n induction for each n. So that's, that's the background uh, in arithmetic I wanted to uh, uh, to start with. And then uh, I, I will go back from technical uh, back to historical uh, to historical part of my talk. So I would like to connect it with uh, with the ideas. Uh, of Gödel and Turing. So um, let's recall uh, the incompleteness theorem of Gödel. And namely, uh, we are more interested in the so-called second incompleteness theorem. So it's useful to introduce this uh, notion of a Gödelian, Gödelian theory, which uh, perhaps is not uh, the standard use of words, but nevertheless, uh, for, for this talk, I prefer to use it. So let's call a theory T Gödelian if it satisfies the following first order theory T, uh, if it satisfies the following um, conditions. The three main conditions are conditions of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So, firstly, we assume that the natural numbers and operations plus and times are definable in T. One can assume that they are just part of the language of T, if the T is in the language of arithmetic. Uh, one can also, uh, if we want to be more, if our results uh, to be applied to larger classes of system, we can assume that uh, these uh, operations are definable in T in terms of uh, relative interpretation, for example, uh, no matter what it is. Uh, Secondly, we assume that uh, a Gödelian theory proves basic properties, of, of some basic properties of these operations. For example, it is sufficient to, to assume that it contains uh, the axioms of elementary arithmetic. It's a pretty weak assumption. And then the second, uh, the third uh, requirement is uh, perhaps the most significant one is that there is an algorithm or equivalently a sigma one formula recognizing the axioms of, of your theory. So your theory has to have a definable set of axioms. And here we of course uh, assume uh, that uh, the formulas of the language of T itself are, which are 
we think of them as, as strings of symbols. But these strings of symbols are coded into the language of arithmetic using some standard Gödel numbering. Uh, so one of the standard systems of coding that allows us to do so. For example, uh, even if, uh, uh, whereas for in the time of Gödel, that might have been one of the uh, greatest ideas in, in, in the proof of his theorems, the, the introduction of this Gödel numbering. For us nowadays, we of course know such systems from, from our computers. Uh, uh, and um, it does not surprise anyone that uh, whatever we do with symbols, we can do with numbers. So that's such a representation is as you. What is important that uh, the set of axioms of, uh, of the theory T is assumed to be uh, computable. Computable or at least uh, computably enumerable, C1 definable. So these uh, are the requirements for systems that we deal with. And then, uh, as Gödel has shown, <coughs> one can write out a sigma one formula denoted box T of X, which expresses in a natural way uh, the property that X is uh, denotes the Gödel number of a formula provable in theory T, so-called probability predicate. And uh, writing the formula not box T uh, falsity, for example, here with box one, we obtain, uh, <coughs> we obtain the, uh, the, formal, the formula expressing consistency of, of our formal system T. T is called consistent if uh, contradiction is not provable in T, and this fact that T is consistent can be ex expressed using the probability predicate in a natural way. So we denote this formula according to Gödel theorem. Then uh, tells you that if the Gödelian theory T is consistent, then the formula Conti is true but unprovable in T. So that was the first and the main uh, uh, example of. Uh, true unprovable statement in formal arithmetic that Gödel discovered. So that's, uh, that's the uh, content of Gödel's second incompleteness uh, theorem, essentially. So, uh, that was uh, proclaimed by Gödel in 1933. Uh, soon it was published, uh, sorry, 1931, so soon it was published, and then uh, immediately logician, logicians started exploring uh, this new phenomenon of incompleteness that was discovered by, by Gödel. And one natural response to it that comes to mind to, to everyone is the following one. Uh, uh, okay, so the formula con, con T, consistency of T, is not provable in T itself. Uh, so what if we just add con T uh, as a new axiom to our system T? After all, if we are using the system T, we sort of believe that it is consistent, so we can add consistency as a new axiom. Will the resulting theory be complete now? Maybe it's enough to, to add just one sentence and obtain a, and overcome the Gödelian incompleteness here. However, uh, the answer is obviously no, uh, because the system T1, T plus con T here, is uh, in fact also Gödelian. If T satisfies the three assumptions, uh, then T plus yet another axiom will satisfy them too. So let's see, uh, natural numbers are still definable. T proves basic properties of these operations. So this property does not change if we increase our theory, right? If we strengthen it and still there is an algorithm recognizing the axioms of our system because we just ended one axiom so our algorithm just 
we add to our algorithm just one more case to consider, particular formula con t. So the answer is uh, yes, uh, the theory t plus con t is Gödelian, and therefore con therefore it is incomplete. Uh, and then Turing uh, suggested to continue this process. In fact, it was not <laughs> Turing who suggested it. Probably it was suggested even earlier by uh, by Church and Kleene, and Turing who just came to uh, came to Princeton to to study to do his PhD under Church uh, took this problem. Turned out to be a very large and important study. However, it is not so well. Uh, it is pretty well known today in the area of computability because of one particular paragraph uh, uh, there, where Turing essentially introduced so-called oracle oracles and uh, oracle computations. Uh, however, uh, for proof theory. Uh, this paper uh, plays a much, uh, I would say, also a very significant uh, role, although it is technically much more involved and, uh, in fact, I would say goes, goes much deeper. So let's uh, see what was uh, this suggestion. So uh, we start adding consistency to our, to our theory. So we start with uh, particular theory T0. Uh, then at the first iteration, we add consistency assertion. Then we obtain a theory T1. It is Gödelian, so its consistency for T1 is not provable. So we obtain T2, which is written here. And, then we, and we can inductively go on and go on. So we obtain the theory Tn plus one by adding consistency to the theory Tn. And the this infinite ascending sequence of extensions of T. Uh, then again, the same question, is the union of, uh, of Tn complete? Now complete. Maybe adding omega many uh, new statements would yield us a complete theory and uh, the incompleteness will be overcome, so to say, in the limit. But unfortunately, the answer is, uh, again, no. Because even though uh, the theory T omega, the union of Tn, is infinitely axiomatized now, still, uh, it is still Gödelian. Because, why? Because the, uh, there is an easy algorithm generating the new axioms for Tn, right, for T omega. So the sequence con T, con T of plus Conti and so on and so on. It's just iteration of one particular construction, the construction of the formula con. In terms of uh, Gödel numbers, if you like, or in terms of uh, strings of symbols, uh, that's a very easy iteration of, uh, of a particular string. So uh, it is computable. Uh, this sequence is computable. And as we know, uh, uh, the set which is generated by a computable uh, function, the, uh, the range of a computable function is computably enumerable. So we see that this uh, set of axioms at least is computably enumerable. It is in fact computable because the sequence increases in uh, the formulas con the n, they're strictly increasing in their in their length. So this is all computable. So the theory T omega is good, and, and we can start the same process from T omega onwards. And obtain theories T omega plus one, T omega plus two, and so on and so on and so on. And so here I depicted <laughs> somewhat uh, graphically how it sort of looks like. So we start with a theory T0 and go right in the right direction by increasing adding new axioms. So we obtain firstly an infinite sequence, then there is a limit of this sequence and so on, another sequence and this goes on and on. 
So that's uh, this process is called is nowadays called the Turing progression. Sometimes Turing Hefferman progression. Uh, the name of Hefferman uh, Hefferman studied uh, uh, these progressions 20 years after Turing, whose work uh, was somehow abandoned for for several decades afterwards. Okay, so that's um, that's how it looks like, and it appears that this process so to say, never ends. Uh, but it has to end, right? So there are obvious uh, reasons for it, for it to end, because let's say, uh, our theories are Gödelian, they are computable, so in particular they are countable, right? And uh, mm, certainly we cannot ab ab obtain uncountable uh, and sequences of uncountable lengths of in, in this way, because to do so, we would need to be able to uh, arithmetize uh, uncountable ordinals, which is not possible in arithmetic. So there are obvious bounds to the length of this. Uh, however, looking in, in details on how far it goes, uh, um, yields that there are multiple problems associated with, with this construction. And Turing uh, dedicated this uh, his thesis to this problem, to the study of this problem. In fact, uh, it is interesting that uh, Turing uh, wasn't studying uh, this, pro this process just for the reason, uh, you know, just for fun. Uh, in fact, overcoming incompleteness wasn't so much his intention as he writes in this paper the following. Uh, so he actually wanted to obtain a classification of arithmetical statements according to the stages of this process. So he wanted to use this, uh, these theories, uh, T alpha, as a kind of measuring stick to measure the strengths of logical theorems. So that's how he puts it in his paper, uh, published in 1939, System of Logic Based on Ordinals in Proceedings of London Mathematical Society. So he writes, uh, we might also expect to obtain an interesting classification of number theoretic theorems according to depth, in quotes a theorem which is required an ordinal alpha to prove it would be deeper than one which could be proved by the use of an ordinal beta less than alpha. However, this presupposes more than is justified. Uh, so this last sentence that I painted in blue needs some explanation. And that's what I'm going to do uh, but basically, uh, so here, here he very explicitly uh, formulates his uh, his uh, intention. He really wanted to play to obtain a certain classification and uh, measure logical theorems, arithmetical theorems, and numbers and theorems, according to their how far they are from, let's say, piano arithmetic in this process, something like that. Now, why does this presuppose more than is justified? This is due to the difficulties uh, and very serious ones that uh, Turing encountered. Uh, in fact, uh, the difficulties are, as we now realize, there are two kinds of difficulties here, why such a classification uh, would be problematic. The one is relatively simple. However, uh, substantial but simple, and it was, uh, let's say, discovered by Pfefferman. So there are there is this logical complexity restriction. I will explain it in a few slides uh, later. The second uh, difficulty is still a difficulty today, and it is called the problem of canonicity of ordinal notation. So that's the first time in history that the, uh, where this problem appeared in the 
essentially explicit form, explicit form uh, in, in a paper. So that essentially one can say that this problem was discovered by Turing. Okay, so um, what is this problem of canonicity of ordinal notation? So as I mentioned, in the order to formulate theories T alpha, one needs to uh, uh, fix their probability predicates, or at least the formulas expressing their consistency, because it is these consistency assertions that form uh, the axioms of, uh, of later theories. So, in fact, uh, what we seem to be defining by transfinite induction here on alpha is not the theory T alpha itself, but rather its consistency assertion. Now, consistency assertion is an arithmetical pi one formula. And in order to, for it to be so, uh, one needs to have uh, arithmetical representations of ordinals at our disposal, because without having alpha or some notation for alpha or some arithmetical formula defining alpha, we will not be able to even state what, what does it mean to, to say that T alpha is consistent. So this is certainly needed and all constructions of T alpha uh, should start somehow with, uh, with representation of ordinals here. Now, ordinals can be represented in arithmetic in, in various ways. And one of, of the ways that was already known by the time of Turing work was de developed by Kleene and George, the so-called Kleene system of ordinal notation O. And there one assigns number to, uh, to certain uh, uh, to specific ways of, um, uh, let's say one assigns uh, notations to certain initial segment of ordinals, so-called constructive ordinals. And um, uh, this, can, this can be done systematically in such a way that every ordinal that has a notation will eventually have a notation in that particular system. Um, for the purposes of Turing project, so Turing also used it and Fetterman used it. However, for the purposes of dealing with it, it is not even necessary to, to use this specific system of notation. For example, if one is satisfied to having sufficiently large uh, initial segments of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, sufficiently large transfinite sequences of these uh, of these theories of these progressions, one can use a simpler idea. Uh, for example, <clears throat> one can say that one can use the fact that every countable ordering or every countable well ordering in particular uh, is embeddable into the ordering into the linear ordering of rational numbers. So for every countable ordinal, one can find a subset of rationals, which would be isomorphic to this particular ordinal with respect to the standard restriction or the standard order, order, ordering on rationals. So fixing a system of ordinal notation is, for example, equivalent to just fixing a subset, a particular computable subset of the rational one. So in fact, when I, draw for you this picture of the ordinal omega squared, essentially, uh, you can realize that the points that I selected here are in fact <laughs> certain rational points on the real line, on the real line. So that's a particular representation of this, uh, of this ordinal notation system that I'm referring to. So one can do it, of course, for, for larger ordinals as well. And in fact, uh, uh, one can show when this is, uh, this is um, easy computability theory tells you that in fact, uh, any ordinal that is representable as a 
recursive or recursively enumerable or even arithmetical binary relation uh, is isomorphic to a certain recursive subset of rational numbers. So this is this is uh, this allows you to uh, to somewhat uh, to be uh, to consider a simpler way of representing ordinals and therefore progression. <coughs> okay, so that would be this seems to be a kind of um, solution for the representation problem. However, then the devil appears in the details, and the devil here is this problem. <coughs> that once you fix a system of notation for ordinals, like a subset of rationals or something, it turns out that the theories that you define uh, actually de depend not so much on the order type of a particular uh, of the ordinal alpha as on the particular way this ordinal alpha is computed or represented. Different uh, ordinal notation systems can give vastly different theories, can assign vastly different uh, theories to, to the same ordinal. And that's, uh, that dependence is what uh, called uh, that uh, induced Turing's pessimism. In fact, what uh, followed people after Turing analyzed this uh, situation in great detail, particularly Pfefferman and Kreisel, and uh, what they collectively show, have uh, shown is that uh, the whole classification idea essentially breaks down because of this problem. So more precisely, there is this result for each true pi one sentence pi including any consistency assertions that, that we so far considered. For every such uh, pi one sentence pi, there is an ordinal notation alpha such that the ordinal of that notation is just omega plus one. And the corresponding theory already proves pi. So every true pi one sentence is proven already at stage omega plus one in this Turing progression. Turing characterizes this theory with a particular, particularly uh, pessimistic remark, typical for his character. So this completeness theorem, writes Turing, is of no value. Is as usual is of no value. And uh, yeah, so Turing apparently considered his work uh, so far uh, usually uh, meaningless. Uh, you should know that by this time he already invented Turing machines and wrote his famous by now famous paper. But for him, it is uh, this completeness theorem, as usual, is of no value. Although it shows, for instance, that it is possible to prove Fermat's last theorem with lambda p, if it is true, yet the truth of the theorem would really be assumed by dating a certain formula as an ordinal form. So the idea to classify, to assign a certain ordinal to Fermat's last theorem will fail because it will be already provable uh, at stage omega plus one. And essentially uh, we, we would only know that this particular way of computing an ordinal is uh, correct by assuming this, that Fermat's last theorem is true. So this is just uh, indeed, a uh, rather meaningless, uh, meaningless result in this respect. So, uh, that's uh, <coughs> the problem. What um, one can do and experience showed in later years that this is possible for many, many uh, natural examples that careful selection of canonical or natural ordinal notations, not produced by the results themselves that one wants to prove using this progression, but rather if one selects ad hoc a natural system to represent ordinals in such a way uh, that one would think. So if you 
want to embed uh, ordinal omega to the omega to the rational state, your favorite simplest embedding, and that would work something like that, despite what Turing proved. So this is uh, this idea actually produces meaningful results and allows to to do this classification. And this is possible. This is shown by now to be possible for very large uh, constructive ordinals, even though we lack a general understanding of what is actually, in general, a natural ordinal. So this problem of natural ordinal notation is still a problem. Uh, proof theories specialists are of various varied opinions on whether it's it has a good solution or it doesn't have a good solution. The fact is that we don't know what it means to be, uh, what it means for an, for an ordinal notation system to be natural. Uh, however, we know many examples of such natural systems. So that's, uh, that's one, one of the big problems, uh, conceptual, one can say problems in proof theory that uh, exist until today since the time of Turing. Okay, now I will uh, say a few more words on, on this logical complexity restriction, that relatively minor issue uh, that, uh, that was present in, in uh, Turing work, Turing's work, but it will lead us to, to the concept of reflection principles that I'm going to discuss next. So there is this fact. Uh, there are true statements that cannot be proved in any stage of a Turing progression based on iteration of consistency. Uh, how, can we, uh, how can we see this? Well, consider this artificial theory T prime. Uh, T prime is a theory obtained by adding to, to the theory T given to us uh, the following sentences, sentences of the form consistency of S, where S runs through all consistent Gödelian theory. So we define what the Gödelian theory is. Uh, so if such a system S is consistent, its consistency assertion on S will be true. So um, the T prime extends T by certain number, countable number of uh, true uh, pi one sentence. So since uh, Turing progression starting with, a, let's say sound theory like piano arithmetic uh, only adds true uh, sentences of the form con S. For theories in the progression, so uh, Obviously, this T prime contains any theory of any Turing progression that we consider. So T prime is stronger than any of it. Uh, one can ask, is the theory T prime Gödelian? No, it is not because uh, the set of sentences con S uh, that we add to the theory T is not computably enumerable. In fact, it is uh, the opposite. It is co-recursively enumerable. It is pi one definable, because in order to uh, define this set, we need to define what it means to be consistent. Consistency is definable by a pi one set. So it is a pi one definable set of sentences. Nevertheless, one can show that in fact the probability predicate for T prime is in fact definable in, in arithmetic and Gödel theorem holds for T prime as well. So one can express con T prime and con T prime will not be provable in T prime. So that's uh, 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 let's say a generalization of Gödel's second incompleteness theorem for this particular case. And then we, we see that since every T alpha is contained in T prime, uh, no theory in a Turing progression will be able to prove consistency of T prime. So con T prime is a sentence which is not 
which is outside Turing progression. Now to deal with it, one has, uh, one has to, uh, there is unfortunately there is a way to deal with it. And it is called, uh, uh, it, it is uh, to consider reflection principles. So what we do is uh, we define new formulas or new schemata, generalizing Gödel's consistency formula, which are called reflection principles for T. So let T be a Gödelian theory, the usual one. Then reflection principles are formulas expressing arithmetical sentences, expressing that every sigma n sentence provable in T is true. Alternatively, uh, these sentences can be also formulated as certain consistency assertions for non gödelian theories, for theories that are obtained by adding to T all true phi n sentences, sentences with n, uh, phi n in the arithmetical hierarchy. So uh, the statement Rn uh, is in fact, uh, expressible by an arithmetical formula of logical complexity by n plus one. So consistency seems, uh, turns out to be equivalent to R zero and it is uh, by one sentence and Rn is a by n plus one sentence. And we consider them and it is uh, experience proved that it is in fact the right generalization of Gödel's consistency assertion to higher levels of uh, arithmetical hierarchy. So whereas uh, we cannot hope to prove any, to prove all true arithmetical sentences just by iterating consistency, we can hope to prove uh, them all. And in fact, there is a corresponding result similar to Turing theorem for pi one, uh, that any true arithmetical sentence is provable in a progression obtained by iterating a suitable reflection principle of appropriate mathematical complexity. So that's that's uh, that's how they these sentences appear. In fact, they appeared first in the work by by Kleene and Rosser, and then they were studied by many others, Sarsky and and so on. Okay. Mm. Now I'm have used one hour of my of my talk for, for this uh, background, but we have introduced all the classical, so to say, material and discussed uh, everything that uh, related to, uh, that was needed for background for, let's say, uh, more modern things I'm going to, to speak about. So if uh, there are any questions, I would be happy to make a, a little break and, and answer them uh, so far. Uh, by the way, uh, mm, could, you, uh, could you explain more about the, uh, the ordinal notation uh, in the Turing's theorem? Yeah, this is the, mm -hmm. first, the first question. The second question that, uh, uh, what, is mm -hmm. the, uh, what is the upper bound of the Turing, uh, of the Turing uh, progression? Uh, mm -hmm. th there should be upper bound, right? Is, uh, the, the, yes. 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 Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's go to. Uh, so what uh, what I meant uh, was uh, 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 my order notation was this. Uh, so we need to uh, to represent ordinals as if. An ordinal is a number, let's say. Uh, how can we do it? Um, we need to assign numbers to ordinals and the process I suggested here was, was this one. Uh, consider uh, rational numbers. Given a well-ordering, accountable well-ordering, well embed uh, this well-ordering into rational numbers. So one can find a suitable subset of rationals, which will be uh, isomorphic to the given well-ordering with, uh, with the standard ordering of rationals. 
and then of course we can uh, we know that rationals are essentially pairs of uh, of natural numbers or integers and one can using pairing one can represent rationals and that will be the so we, one can talk about elements of a well ordering as if they were rational or numbers or pairs of natural numbers. So that's the way the way how, how we can talk about ordinals in arithmetic. Now there was this additional requirement needed for Turing progression stated here that the ordering must be computable. And this amounts to the following requirement that the subset of, of the rationals that we select uh, is computable as a set of uh, uh, of rational numbers. Then with any algorithm uh, that uh, decides whether uh, a rational number is in ordinal or not, in ordinal notation or not, one can associate uh, having such, uh, such, such an algorithm, we can write out in mathematical sigma one formula, representing it and then uh, use it in the construction of the alpha. So that's, that's roughly how it works or can work. There are other ways of doing it, but uh, this one seems to be the simpler. Uh, as to the second question, the, the second question was uh, for which ordinals uh, alpha do such Turing progressions uh, exist or can be defined? And the answer here is theoretically for all so-called constructive, constructive ordinals. So it is well known that uh, among countable ordinals, uh, among countable ordinals, there is a certain. I will write on my slide here. Uh, so this is the ordinal zero, one, ten, 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 omega, etc. But all goes, so if one goes far enough, so let's depict here the ordinal omega one, the first uncountable one. However, uh, there is a certain ordinal, which is the sup supremum of all computable ordinals, right? Uh, of ordinals of those well orderings that are embeddable as computable subsets of the rational. And this ordinal is a special ordinal. It's called Omega One Church Cleaney. It was first identified by by Church and Cleaney in, in their work on ordinal notations. And it is well known that this ordinal indeed has to exist. Uh, it cannot be itself uh, computable, but is uh, but is the supremum of all. Computable ordinal. So every for every ordinal below omega one church there is uh, there is um, a computable system of notation, and for every ordinal above there is no. Okay, thank you. So that's uh, that's um, the answer to your question. Uh, thank you for it because uh, uh, this is good to know. In fact, it is even if uh, if you are a student and hear about these things for the first time, but know a little bit computability theory. It's a good exercise and in fact, a very nice one to show that such an ordinal exists and is strictly less than omega one. So try to, uh, I, I uh, very much rec recommend this uh, as, an, as an exercise or as a problem, entrance problem to the theory of computable ordinals. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, so that's it, and let's go. Let's go on. Okay, so that um, so we introduce these reflection principles as generalizations of good of um, of uh, consistency assertion. Now, uh, what we are saying is. Uh, now let's uh, start with a topic uh, relate, uh, which is called reflection algebra. So this notion of reflection principle will lead us to the notion of reflection algebra, which is kind of 
uh, how we see these things from more general, more abstract point of view today. So, um, consider some minimal theory like elementary arithmetic that we dealt with, uh, that I introduced uh, earlier. And as we see by dealing with progression, we deal with constructing certain hierarchies of systems, extending given system. So where do all these objects live? In fact, they live in a certain big superstructure, which I denote GEA. GEA is a set of all Gödelin extensions of elementary arithmetic. I defined what a Gödelin extension is. And our modular equivalence, which I denote equivalence EA. Well, this one is defined as follows. So we can say that a theory S is smaller than T if uh, the following condition holds. One can say that if uh, S is stronger than T, provably in elementary arithmetic. Whatever is probably provable in T is provable in S. For all x, every formula x provable in T is provable in, in S. And this very fact is verifiable in our minimal system, EA. So, of course, in model theory, for example, or in set theory, model theory, one usually views first order theory in basic courses in logic. One usually views first order theories uh, just as sets of sentences possibly deductively closed under first order logic. And then it is natural to define an ordering on theories like inclusion, theory S is stronger than T if uh, every theorem of S is a theorem of T or every axiom of S is a theorem, uh, uh, if every axiom of, of T is a theorem of S and uh, uh, in, uh, set theoretic, essentially set theoretic inclusion. Here we deal with more information. Uh, uh, for Gödelian theory, we deal not so much with theories with sets themselves, but rather with, the, with their proof predicates. So we deal simultaneously with the theory and with its representation in some meta theory, in this case, elementary. And here we require that this inclusion is provable. That's a natural. Uh, ordering relation that is invariant under the properties that we are going to study. Properties that allow us to go, so we can replace one probability predicate by an equivalent one, uh, but uh, uh, it does not mean that we can replace always a theory by an equivalent theory because that's weaker than uh, being able to formalize this in elementary. So that's the, uh, the relation that we consider the associate. It, it is a obviously transitive uh, reflexive relation, pre-ordering. Therefore, uh, the associated equivalence relation is in fact an equivalence relation. And, uh, the structure of all Gödel and extensions uh, with this ordering Modular equivalence is a low, is a, in fact, a semi lattice. We consider it uh, in this talk as a lower semi lattice. So just uh, semi lattice with operation, uh, I denote as, as usual in lattices by a lower bound. And in this context, it corresponds to uh, the union of theories S and T axiomatized in a natural way. So we fix the probability predicate for S union with T in a natural way, given, given those for S and T. So uh, that's the basic structure, semi lattice of Gödelian extensions of EA that we are going to deal with. Every uh, the reflection principles and the consistency assertions uh, that we dealt with so far can be seen as defining certain operations, unary operations, mappings from 
that structure to the structure. So if we consider the semi lattice of Goodwin extension of S, each Rn reflection principle defines a map. So it maps a, a theory T to the theory Rn of T, right? Uh, axiomatized by uh, S plus the axiom Rn of T. And that's the unary operation which happens to be to usually satisfy certain good properties, among which one of them is it is. If x is smaller than y, then r of x is smaller than r of y. Then there is this property of semi-idempotence. So idempotence means that double r is equivalent to single r. Uh, however, here we have something weaker, which is called semi-idempotence. r of r of x is less than r of x. And sometimes the operations that appear, but this is not satisfied for Rn, is uh, uh, the closure property that x is smaller or equal than R of x. So uh, the operations, the reflection principles are monotone and they're semi idempotent, but they are not idempotent neither and not, nor are they closure. So that's, uh, that's roughly how we can now uh, see these things. With any, sometimes we can iterate uh, with, uh, with uh, any operator, we can also consider its iteration. And this can be done in this semi lattice for computable operations. So if R is uh, so an operator R is called computable. If um, uh, it can be defined by a computable map on the girdle numbers of formulas uh, defining the extensions of the elements of GT. So this GT also bears the structure of uh, the numbering, if you like, and then operator is computable if it is uh, uh, defines a computable map on GT. Uh, and then uh, computable operators can be iterated. And that's the content of this result. There exist theories R alpha. So given an elementary uh, recursive well ordering, and if R is a computable monotone semi idempotent operator, then there should always exist uh, theories R alpha or of S for every alpha uh, index alpha from our uh, elementary recursive ordering, satisfying the natural conditions to what we would expect from iteration. So R0 of S is S and R alpha of S is the union of operator R applied to all the theories R beta for beta smaller than alpha. So that's exactly how I would uh, define iterations of of theories in a Turing progression, as well as here. So it works in a, as you see, in a rather general general setup. So one can show that uh, when these conditions are satisfied, then uh, each R alpha will be also computable and monotone semi important And even unique, and even such, operation, uh, such operators are alpha are unique modular provable equivalence in our system. So, so this result is just tells you that uh, in this general context, one can also deal with, uh, with general notion of iteration, which precisely corresponds to the construction of Turing progression. So this can be done uh, rather easily in this way. Um, mm -hmm. And then, we go back to this idea of Turing. We go back to this idea of Turing. How to measure uh, the strengths of systems? How to classify arithmetical statements according to their ordinals? And here uh, we come to the notion, which is uh, uh, to the notion of uh, pi n plus one ordinal, or proof theory pi n plus one ordinal of S denoted ord n of s. This is the supremum of all ordinals alpha, given a natural ordinal notation system for which 
uh, our alpha iteration of Rn is provable in, in S. So uh, once again, suppose we are given a system as a Gödel extension of elementary arithmetic. Uh, what we do, we generate, we, we take uh, our schema Rn, our operator, our refraction operator Rn, iterate it as many times as it is possible, as long as uh, our alpha's iteration Rn alpha of Ea is provable in S. The supremum of all these ordinals alpha will be denoted ord n of S. So this is uh, called the pi n plus one ordinal with respect to given ordinal notation system of S. And then the conservativity spectrum of S is a sequence of all ordinals for all possible n. So pi one ordinal, pi two ordinal, pi one ordinal alpha zero, pi two ordinal i for one, pi three ordinal i alpha two, and so on and so on. So this is how we, in fact, today characterize, can characterize uh, proof theoretic strength. It relates not only to, uh, to one particular ordinal, but rather for a family. Uh, we associate with a system, a family of ordinals, each of them, each of them measuring the strength of S with respect to particular complexity class. Uh, pi one, pi two, pi three, so the system S may have different strength with respect to each of these classes. So examples of uh, known spectra are, are given here. I uh, ignore the question how to compute them. So far it uh, um, can be done by different means, but uh, uh, that's what we obtain, for example. If one takes uh, the theory such as I sigma one, a fragment of piano arithmetic, then it's, my one ordinal will be omega to the omega, relatively small. The next ordinal will be just omega and then just one, and it ends with a tail of zeros, which is related to the fact that the complexity of the system itself, I sigma one, is exactly pi three. So it, it, uh, uh, the axioms of I sigma one, they uh, are equivalent to pi three formulas. And therefore, uh, starting from number four, we, we see zeros everywhere. For PA, this is not so. And the resulting sequence of ordinals looks like this, epsilon zero, epsilon zero, epsilon zero, and everywhere one finds epsilon naught. So the unreflect is a system which is very uniform and has the same strength in every complex. And if one adds, for example, the warm principle that I formulated earlier to PA, uh, then the ordinals will be different. Uh, it will be epsilon zero square in the first case, epsilon zero times two in the second, in pi one, epsilon zero in pi three, and so on, uh, all epsilon zeros uh, afterwards in P. This is related to the two parts of the system. One principle accounts for the increase here, somewhat strangely to epsilon zero square, and uh, the other part of the axioms may give you epsilon zero. Of course, epsilon zero, I didn't um, uh, define it. Probably I should say that epsilon zero is the supremum of omega, omega to the omega, to the omega to the omega, and so on and so forth. So that's the famous uh, proof theoretic ordinal of the Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, roughly what we, in fact, uh, nowadays learn about a formal system by doing its proof theoretic analysis in arithmetical complexity by up to uh, Let's go on. I may uh, short. So let's. Uh, now, 
uh, having said all that, uh, that's the basic structure we we deal with. The reflection algorithm. That's the main object of my of my talk, if you like. Uh, and, uh, the purpose of uh, if you roughly have the idea what it uh, what I have defined so far, then this is a message uh, from my talk. So it's useful to study this structure. So the structure, the lattice GT, Gödel extensions of T, with the uh, the usual semi lattice lower bound operation. Uh, one T is a, a top element of this structure which corresponds to the constant, so to say, the equivalence class of T itself. So points in that structure are, are theory. And then there is a family of monotone semi idempotent operations, RN, reflection principles, uh, that act somehow on this, on this structure. So that's... Um, the information, that's the universe in which one can uh, deal and study this conservativity spectra, proof of the coordinates, and so on. So what we are having in common, uh, from this point on, we would like to say a few more words about uh, what this structure is. Uh, so we would like to uh, learn about, so when one encounters uh, a particular uh, algebraic structure, and here we see that that's just can be viewed as an al abstract algebra, right? It's coming from proof theory, but in fact, it is uh, a structure which is uh, a semi lattice with operations. One would be interested in two basic questions, many more perhaps as well, but the two are most important. What are the identities of this structure? In other words, what are the laws that govern the behavior of these, of the operations of our structure? What is the system of identities that is satisfied? And what is the sub-algebra generated by, by constant? What are the, consider the set of uh, elements of this algebra, which are generated from one by applying all these operations, conjunction and Rn. And this is called the one, or zero generated subalgebra, or it's a minimal subalgebra of that structure, and it turns out to be related very much to proof uh, to proof theory. So uh, these are two basic questions, and let us give quickly the answer to them. So uh, the system of identities uh, is uh, the system of uh, can be seen as a system of expressions of the form alpha turnstile beta, where turnstile is a proof theoretic notation just for the uh, less than operation that I represented earlier, algebraically it's less than. So what, what, are, what is this reflection compass? So we have, uh, it's an extension of propositional, of a weak propositional logic. So we have propositional variables, we have constant top, we have, uh, we have uh, conjunction, with the usual formation rule. And we have unary operations, which are here, uh, are written just as N alpha. So N alpha means applying R N to alpha informally. So formulas are, for example, written like that, or even we can sometimes delete this top constant because we can, we can sort of figure out where it should be, like uh, here. Okay. The basic derivable objects that we consider here are sequence. So we have expressions of the form alpha turns style beta, where alpha and beta are formulas in this language. And here are the rules and axioms. So we have first group of, uh, of rules saying that the relation turns style is reflexive. Uh, top is the top and uh, turn style is transitive. So it is pre-ordered, if you like. We have usual axioms for conjunction, saying that conjunction is a lower bound in terms of this pre-order. Most interestingly, we have principles for the operations Rn. So we have semi 
are the importance that I already mentioned before. We have monotonicity if alpha turns to beta, then n alpha turns to n beta. And finally, two more principles uh, that Rn implies Rm. This is uh, n reflection is stronger than m reflection. And secondly, this is a mixed principle uh, that sort of Rn sub subsumes Rm. So Rn alpha together with Rm beta implies Rn of, of alpha together with M beta, Rm beta. So well, that's the principle that actually hold in this for our reflection principles in this algebra. Uh, so uh, these are the main properties of this reflection calculus, first studied by Evgeny Dashkov uh, in 2012. Firstly, first result is that in fact alpha turnstile beta is provable in RC, in our system, even only if in our algebra, this, this inequality alpha less than T beta holds. Which means that particularly that identities derivable in RC are precisely all, all the identities, exactly those identities which hold in this algebra. So, RC gives a complete answer to, to this question. Uh, secondly, uh, we have two pleasant properties that RC is in fact computationally simple. It is polytime decidable. One can, there is an algorithm, polytime computable algorithm, uh, which allows you to check whether alpha implies beta or not. In, in this and it is accompanied by a Kripke completeness then. There is a Kripke model uh, Kripke model for the for the logic RC and uh, and uh, RC enjoys finite model property. The first result is most significant of, of them all, but it is a consequence of something more general known from uh, from the work of uh, Japariz in 1986, in fact, for a very old work of Japariz concerning the probability logic JLP. So that's the, uh, these are the main properties that show that we uh, RC is a relatively good, uh, good and uh, nice system. Uh, what about this uh, subalgebra, minimal subalgebra? Minimal subalgebra of, uh, of GT, as follows from the first claim here, corresponds to the uh, variable free fragment of the system RC. I think my time is, is over. Um, may I use a few more minutes to uh, to finish to come to something? Or... Yeah, no problem. Just take your time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, so uh, subalgebra generated uh, the minimal subalgebra subalgebra generated by constant one in this lattice of theories. Is in fact corres uh, corresponds in fact to the variable free fragment of RC. F those formulas of RC which have no variables, just built up from constants using conjunction and operations. And it turns out that this uh, uh, fragment uh, is also rather nice. Uh, so let W denote the set of all variable free formulas. Then uh, on this set, we can define, of course, the equivalence relation in, in the logic RC. And we can define yet another natural ordering, namely the ordering beta implies n reflection of alpha. So if alpha and beta were theories, we would uh, say here that beta proves n reflection of alpha, which proof theory that usually is interpreted as saying that beta is much stronger or n stronger than than uh, than alpha so it's kind of relation between beta and alpha telling that beta is uh, that alpha and beta are not close so they're sort of apart beta is much stronger than alpha so, turns out that this relation is a transitive uh, ordering and 
what we have is this. This is firstly every formula in every variable free formula, formula in W, is equivalent to a word, formula without conjunction. That can be analyzed from the rules. Secondly, it turns out that the set of uh, formulas, the W module of the equivalence relation, equipped with the ordering less than zero, is in fact isomorphic, is in fact well-founded and isomorphic to the ordinal epsilon zero with a less than relation. So, uh, despite uh, uh, certain simplicity of the system RC0 and formulas without variables, turns out that nevertheless the structure of W with this ordering is, um, is rather interesting. It is a well ordering epsilon zero which allows you to, in fact, view this uh, W with this relation as, a, as yet another ordinal representation, as a system of ordinal notation. And in fact, it turns out that this system of ordinal notation is exactly the one tightly related to piano. So let's see uh, how it works out here. Let's go for... Uh, for some further properties of it. So, right, since I have uh, not so much time left, practically no time left, uh, let me uh, try to do the following. I will, uh, in a few slides, in two slides, I will explain how the uh, this set of uh, this ordering on W, the system RC, relates to the warm principle I started my lecture with. I will try to uh, establish this connection and then will be uh, the end of my talk. I will point to the modern literature on this, on this topic. <laughs> Let's say on my latest papers on, on it and, and, and then uh, that will be it. So um, the link uh, goes uh, by this uh, <clears throat> particular result which is called the reduction property. So here we introduce a relation and equivalence on elements of our structure. We say the two theories U and V are an equivalent if they prove the same pi n plus one sentence. So this is uh, this turns out to be an equivalence relation, and in fact uh, uh, also quite uh, proof theoretically interesting <coughs> equivalence relation often studied in, uh, in proof theory in uh, conservation results. So uh, if U and V are N equivalent, that means that they are rather close. And the bigger N, the closer they are. So in some sense, this uh, relations equivalence N, they introduce a kind of, uh, kind of uh, quasi-metric, one can say, on, these, on, on formal theories. So they, they introduce some kind of distance between them. And this distance is the bigger and the shorter. So a small vicinity of a system are those which are n equivalent to it or larger n. OK, so that's the intuition. And then it turns out that the following results holds under certain conditions that are not so important for us, that whenever the theory u, one has uh, that n plus 1 reflection for u is n equivalent to n reflection for u iterated omega times. So that's the, <clears throat> the uh, this result is called the reduction theorem because it sort of reduces a more complicated formula, r n plus one of u, which is pi n plus two formula, to iterations of a simpler formulas, formulas which are only pi n plus one. So, Bigger reflection can be sort of exchanged, exchanged into omega many smaller reflection. And in fact, so you give uh, sort of one gold coin, you receive omega many silver coins. So that's the, the principle that uh, uh, 
how we sort of view this uh, view this prism. However, this n equivalence relation for uh, for any n, in particular for n equals zero, it has a nice property that it preserves the consistency strings. So the consistency of two <coughs> consistency statements for two equivalent series are in fact are in fact equivalent. So equivalent and equivalent series are equiconsistent. And that's a very basic thing, uh, which allows us to reduce the question of consistency of more complicated arithmetical assertions to consistencies of less complicated arithmetical assertions. Okay, one particular example. Okay, uh, is this result by Parsons and Min? So if one takes the theory R i sigma one, it happens to be simply the same reductively equivalent to R two of E a. And once one applies this theorem to it, one reduces it to omega fold iteration of R1, which in turn is equivalent to the so-called primitive recursive arithmetic. So that's, a, <clears throat> that's a result that is uh, uh, very uh, important for the study of this, uh, of this reflection algebra. And then how we explain these steps in the, in the worm game uh, thing that I promised it is as follows. So suppose we have a certain worm or word alpha, in, word in the alphabet of natural numbers. As I said, every such word uh, can be considered as an element of W, right? W is defined here as a set of um, variable free formulas of RC. So these are words are particular formulas, variable free formulas in which conjunction does not occur, which means essentially that there are a sequences of applications of our operators Rn for various n. Right? So we view this alpha as a, a sequence of operations of, of R, Rk for, for various finite lengths. And then we sort of look at it and uh, uh, see what it is equivalent to. Uh, so uh, let alpha s denote the value of alpha in our lattice of theories in GS. Uh, for example, in, uh, in GEA. Uh, then what we see is this. So alpha s, uh, alpha is this word beginning with n plus one. So alpha s is uh, the result of applying Rn plus one to the theory U, where U is S together with the interpretation of the remaining part of the word beta, beta s. By the reduction property, so this is Rn plus one of U is a typical formula, which is amenable to the reduction property. So we can sort of reduce it and uh, conclude that it is equivalent, in fact, n equivalent, by, but also zero equivalent to that sequence of, uh, to Rn omega of u, which is the same thing as the union of all these uh, principles, k fold iterations, Rn k of u, or finite k. So, now, what are these Rn k of u? Uh, Rn k of u, uh, of course, uh, are particular uh, operators R and K are um, representable in our structure by this modality N and R K, K N of U, they correspond to particular formulas written out here. So if beta is uh, the remaining part of alpha, uh, then R and K of U correspond to the formulas N beta, N of beta conjunction with N beta, n of beta conjunction with n of beta and conjunction. So this looks like at the beginning finite stages of the Turing progression. In fact, they are. In fact, these are just generalizations of Turing progressions, omega many steps, but not for consistency, but for Rn. And not over basic theory Ea, but rather over some theory extremized by beta. 
important thing is that all these formulas written out here are still in W. So what we what we have is that uh, that all these formulas do not go outside of W. They are still in our subalgebra. Uh, and since so, since they are in W, and we know that every word in W is uh, every um, formula in W is equivalent to a word, that means that each one of them is also equivalent to a word. Uh, that's very important. Moreover, these words can be computed. It's not a big deal to actually calculate these words. Now, it turns out that these words, in fact, will look precisely as the words uh, in our initial worm game. So these are the iterations of this initial part of the worm, uh, that if uh, alpha was the worm, then uh, case element from that sequence, for example, like this one, will correspond to this element will correspond to the uh, three times iterated, uh, three times iterated uh, worm in the worm game. So uh, this, uh, these are exactly the worms, uh, uh, they were read off from this process. So in fact, uh, then the worm game is just this uh, amounts to this. We delete the zero once we encounter uh, a word in which uh, which uh, in which the reduction property does not apply, so that corresponds to the successor ordinals in W, and uh, uh, for all other words in W, we apply uh, this particular rule, which allows you uh, us to descend below and go from stronger series to lower series. So this establishes somehow a very tight correspondence between worms, if you like, elements of our algebra W and arithmetical series. So this correspondence is rather canonical in this, in this context. So we read off the rules of the worm game from, from uh, analysis of reflection principles, how it relates to PA. Uh, very easily, PA is uh, equivalent to elementary arithmetic plus full induction, but this can be replaced and this is well known by full reflection. So this uh, uh, PA is EA plus, if you like, RN uh, of EA for each N smaller than omega, which gives you the limit of this process of the size epsilon naught. And that's more or less uh, uh, how one proves using this method the independence of the worm principles. And one can also apply, one can also obtain uh, in this way all the other results related to proof theory of arithmetic, which I'm not uh, talking here, but uh, uh, because I probably have to stop. So. Uh, uh, the moral from this is using these uh, methods, one can actually, in one go or using one idea and very modular, modular one, obtain all the main results on the proof theory of, of piano arithmetic that are well known, including the consistency proofs or characterization of its proof recursive functions, combinatorial principles. Uh, our uh, study goes by now far beyond that. And I must uh, also mention that many people contributed, including Jost Josten, David Fernandez Duque, and uh, Fyodor Pahomov, uh, Dashkov, and many others. And uh, so I would like to thank you for attention. And here are the, my latest papers on this uh, uh, that you can read. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I have a short question. Ah, hello, Joost. Yes, uh, yeah. Nice to hear you. Although I don't see you, but it, it is nice to. Uh, 
Look here, you can. Good to hear you too, Lev. I will say hello. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello, yes. Okay. Good. I had a question. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, I had a question. You mentioned that actually uh, the the worm principle was discovered by Hamana and Oka, uh, Okada uh, prior to your uh, um, yes. publication. So in what context and uh, where did it originate in their studies? Okay, that's a good, uh, yeah, good point. So um, uh, in fact, the story goes that when, when I published the preprint on, on worms, uh, then Lorenzo Carl Carlucci, uh, a few months later, uh, who read it, uh, pointed me to that paper by Hamano and Okada, and they were motivated by the, they arrived at it very easily. In fact, Buchholz, in the study of uh, his work on uh, Pi-11 comprehension uh, and bar induction, he developed a certain system of ordinal notations for that second order system and formulated the so-called Buchholz Hydra battle. Uh, that was uh, essentially the generalization of the usual Hydra battle, uh, which was earlier one of these famous basic principles by uh, Paris and Kirby. Uh, so Buchholz found an analog of this for labeled trees and uh, showed that it is independent of uh, pi 11 comprehension plus bar induction, something like that. Uh, now, the, the battle for label trees was, of course, uh, uh, formulated in, uh, in a more complicated way than the, than the battle for ordinary trees. However, the Japanese, uh, Hamano and Okada, uh, they decided to look at the very simplest case of that battle, namely uh, linear labeled trees. So they took Buchholz uh, uh, branching trees, they uh, considered linear labeled trees and, and formulated rules uh, of the game by Buchholz. And then their task was to calculate the ordinal uh, or uh, let's say uh, the proof theoretic strength of the resulting principle, they calculated it and related it to Hydra and uh, piano arithmetic, so it turned out to be epsilon naught. And then, surprise, surprise, uh, the rules happen to be very similar to words. They are not quite uh, literally the same, but the difference is, you can say, cosmetic. You delete or you leave out zero here and there. So I think our worms are somewhat nicer, but uh, it's a matter of perception because they're essentially equivalent. So that's, uh, so that's the, the story. So therefore, the, I think the real contribut contributor here perhaps uh, is Buchholz with his, uh, with his uh, 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 labeled trees. Uh, and then uh, again, this is uh, there was another paper that uh, sort of um, showed that uh, there is some strange connection between this system's uh, system of notation for PA and uh, the system uh, of notation for pi one one comprehension. Uh, namely, uh, the paper by Schutte and Simpson who studied the notion of uh, gap embedding. So Friedman uh, had this uh, principle of uh, well quasi ordering for labeled trees, which is of the same strength as Buchwald Hydra. And it is again with this gap condition. And again, these gap conditions uh, that they can be related to, to the conditions uh, so, Schutt and Simpson considered a linear version of it where, where you have uh, essentially words. Again, with gap condition, they showed that it is well quasi ordering. And it turns out to be, again, related to our worms because uh, using the fact that this is a well quasi order, you, you quickly prove that these are, these are uh, 
terminating sequences that we deal with. So that was Carlucci's uh, and Geshe Klee's work who sort of uh, established this uh, detailed connection between between these uh, these things. So that was a, that was this. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, Les. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question or comments? Okay. Uh, uh, I have some questions. Yeah. Uh, the one mm -hmm. principle uh, is interesting. It's a, a natural a mathematical uh, concrete independent sentence. And uh, you see that uh, it is equivalent to sigma reflection uh, principle. And as mm -hmm. far as I know, some other natural independent sentence, such as uh, the PH pair Hamilton uh, sentence, uh, is also equivalent to uh, sigma reflection. So this is mm -hmm. amazing, amazing phenomenal for me. Just uh, uh, people have found many uh, natural concrete uh, independent sentences, but uh, all these sentences uh, are all equivalent to sigma reflection. Yeah, my question is that, uh, mm, do you know any uh, 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 example of the, uh, the concrete uh, independent sentence of arithmetic, which is, uh, uh, which is, not, uh, uh, which is stronger than sigma reflection? Uh, uh, because all, all example I know are equivalent to sigma reflection. So like, this is an amazing phenomenon for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, good question. So, um, uh, short answer. Uh, uh, short answer is no. So there are many questions, uh, many interesting examples, all of which are equivalent to, uh, to sigma one reflection indeed. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are somewhat artificial examples that would be not, not equivalent. So uh, somewhat artificial examples, uh, I think can be known. So if you lo are looking for stronger, so principles uh, stronger than sigma one reflection, uh, then, um, Again, I cannot give you uh, uh, any examples right now, but I'm pretty sure something something can be stated. They will not be as convincing as a simpler example. So that's uh, for one thing. People tried also to construct uh, sentences that would be weaker than um, than sigma one reflection by considering functions which are not provably recursive. Uh, but still um, slower growing than the than this, for example, Worm function or the Paris Harrington function. So you can play with the growth rate of functions in such a way uh, that you will obtain principles that are, for example, weaker than uh, weaker than than that. Uh, but it is uh, as, as I think it's a matter of uh, how uh, how nice these statements look like. So you can artificially uh, distort them in such a way that they will be uh, not equivalent. But um, it's not as convincing as a nice principle. So they would not be called nice in in my in my uh, classification, so to say. Into so, um, but uh, yet another question that. Uh, Harry Friedman, uh, of course, studied uh, a lot. Uh, is uh, um, how or why? Um, so maybe maybe thinking about this. So, uh, for example, uh, um, consider consider uh, the Friedman's principle, uh, Friedman's finite version of Kraskal theory. For example, uh, so uh, we know that it is independent of some stronger systems of se second-order arithmetic, like ATR naught, right? Uh, the version of Kraskal theorem is a pi two statement, which is independent of something which is stronger than PA, 
Therefore, it is also independent of PA. So one can find natural fine two tendencies which are uh, far beyond uh, sigma one reflection for PA. However, they are in turn equivalent to sigma one reflection for some other theory, which is uh, somehow logical theories about PA, something like that. Something like that is known. So this is uh, and convincing. Uh, so in that sense, that gives gives positive answer to your question. However, uh, it's not the increase of logical complexity. So it's the same complexity pi two, but but higher up, higher up in the hierarchy. So to say that such principles we do know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I said I have a look of Friedman's yeah, work. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the last slide, uh, the calorie, mm -hmm. uh, what, what does it tell us for the case and n, n, n is more than two? Uh, in the last slide, uh, the important uh -huh. uh, calorie. Okay. Uh, you, you, uh -huh. uh, okay. Uh, yeah. For, uh, should I, should I uh, explain what's uh, what this, this corollary? Um, okay, so um, so this is a result proven by Ulf Schmel in 19, uh, I think, 79, or maybe something like the beginning of, end of 70s. Um, so uh, as you see, it relates, the annual arithmetic shows that it is N equivalent to Rn reflection iterated epsilon naught times. That means that these two theories prove the same pi n plus one sentences, so they're pi n plus one conservative over one another. So this result essentially implies uh, that the conservativity spectrum of PA is precisely that sequence, epsilon not epsilon not epsilon not epsilon not epsilon not, and so on. So it describes consequences of PA of any specific complexity pi n in terms of epsilon zero times iterated reflection of appropriate complexity, Rn reflection. So uh, indeed uh, n zero is level of pi one uh, and uh, it shows that consistency of pi pa is equivalent to epsilon zero plus one times iterated consistency of ea. Uh, for n equals one, uh, we have epsilon zero times uh, iterated R1 reflection, so sigma one reflection. And um, iteration of sigma one reflection is the same thing as, iter as diagonalizing the class of probably recursive functions. So we essentially relate uh, uh, to the theory on the right. Uh, has uh, the class of provable functions corresponding exactly to the so-called fast-growing hierarchy. So this result for n equal one is a relation of provable functions for PA and fast-growing hierarchy. So you read off fast-growing hierarchy from the right-hand side and you get the theorem from comparing the right and left-hand sides of this equation. So these are very basic and important results. So you uh, if, however, indeed, for every n bigger than one, there is also the corresponding conservativity. Uh, for example, uh, you can say that pi three consequences of P will be the same as iterated pi three reflection uh, epsilon naught times over this. So. Um, um, if we had some interesting, uh, you know, class of uh, combinatorial statements characteristic for complex class by three, we would have obtained perhaps from, from this result some by three combinatorial independence, but we don't have anything convincing at hand. Uh, so uh, therefore we don't have uh, impressive examples like, uh, like we do. Worms or Paris Harrington or something like that, but potential potentially that might actually 
be possible. Uh, three quantifiers is not yet too many, and there are plenty of mathematical theorems with three quantifier changes that, that are of interest. Therefore, I think there is some potential here to find something interesting in complexity pi three. But as far as I know, this has not been worked out. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, 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 Turing theorem uh, tells that uh, any power one two uh, sentence can be proven in some iteration where the consistent uh, sen sentence. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it says that uh, uh, Feynman proved theorem that uh, he generalized Turing theorem. We see that uh, any two arithmetic uh, sentence can be proven mm -hmm. in some uh, iteration where the reflection principle. Yeah. So yeah, my question is that uh, so uh, what's the difference between uh, free, uh, uh, Friedman's approach? Uh, uh, and and your approach, uh, but because both of you uh, both use the reflection principle uh, for the iteration, yeah, and this is my my confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Pfefferman considered iterating full uniform reflection. So in fact, uh, in his in his work, he took the the uniform full uniform reflection schema rather than the restriction to particle plus phi n. As, uh, as here, as I presented here, but I presume that this difference is not really fundamental. So that's basically, Kofferman was concerned with generalizing works of Turing, which are negative results. Uh, as you see, uh, so this theorem as stated here, I, I, I uh, um, consider it and Pfefferman also and Turing considered it as a kind of uh, disappointment. Right, so it's a negative result. If everything true can be proven at, at a specific ordinal, that means that uh, this does not allow you to classify anything. So instead, so the, the direction of my research, as well as uh, the research by Schmerl, who, whose result appeared at the very last slide, is, uh, is that uh, uh, Despite all this, we want to obtain positive results. Uh, so isolate the conditions and situations where, where this approach actually does work. And for the case of, for example, this reflection principles for PA, indeed, um, it shows that it can work uh, uh, as described. Um, now we can... Uh, uh, so what, what is going on nowadays is, is that we try to generalize it to stronger systems like predicative or even impredicative uh, theories, but um, uh, but indeed uh, the whole direction of this of, of this work is, is, is exactly opposite. So we, we obtain positive results like characterizing co <laughs> consequence, uh, consequences of a specific system of a specific complexity by iterations of reflection principles. So that's uh, that's the main difference. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question or comments? Yeah, anyone? Anyone? Yeah, I, I encourage you to uh, use this chance to communicate with Levy, okay? Uh, yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. Okay, uh, if no one, yeah. Um, anyway, I, I just asked the, the final question that uh, 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 for your iteration theorem, uh, does that theorem depend on uh, the Omega, just uh, so recursive we are ordering. Uh, uh, you mean this one? Uh, iteration theorem. Yes. Uh, uh, you mean this theorem? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it works for an arbitrary elementary recursive, or you can say recursive well ordering, and arbitrary monotone semi idempotent operator on, on this lattice. So that's that's the condition where it is sensible to define iteration. So it need not be 
omega, it can be essentially anything. And how we apply it, we, uh, as you have seen later in this, uh, in the slice of this talk, we, we consider this uh, system W uh, of words as an ordinal notation system. So we consider as omega, uh, in fact, the system W. Uh, uh, and then uh, apply these, uh, these iterations and relate them to the, to the words. And that's how it all works out. Okay, uh, is it that your following work uh, uh, depend on uh, this theorem, just our offer? Uh, but uh, when I first uh, look at it, it seems that uh, whether it's, it's better to state this theorem or follow, just see that uh, under some uh, natural conditions, uh, the, uh, uniquely uh, there is these uh, sort of theorems are offered with the following property. Uh, yeah, do, do you think so? Uh, because, uh, yeah, um, because you're following, you use this R offer, uh, but uh, natural, uh, we don't um, use this, uh, we need that this theorem is unique uh, in some sense. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so, yeah, so <laughs> it looks to me that uh, uh, why you just say this, just uh, un uh, under some conditions, uh, uniquely uh, there exist uh, theorems are offer with the following property and uh, in the following work, uh, you use this uh, offer uh, in your uh, following slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So uh, mm, I didn't quite get your question. Uh, so far. so that was a suggestion uh, to to state it uh, somehow differently, right? So could you repeat your question somewhat? Uh, uh, in more detail so that I would understand it. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's not a question, it's just uh, uh, uh -huh. anyway, some, some concern is that uh, because uh, yes. uh, usually we don't only uh, want to know that there is something with some property. Uh, it's better that uh, we know that uh, uh, uniquely in some sense there is something with some property. Uh, uh, yeah, because in the following, you, you use this uh, offer uh, in your definition of this uh, uh, reflection uh, uh, in, uh, in the algebra uh, in your follow work about the, mm -hmm. the, yeah, uh, and this, this is only a concern and uh, not, mm -hmm. not a question. <laughs> no, uh, let me, okay, let me try, maybe, maybe um, I try to uh, comment as follows. Uh, so, um, so in order to define these iterations, we need an ordering along which we would like to iterate. Uh, so without an ordering, we cannot define iterations. So that's uh, the, uh, the basic uh, setup that we, uh, uh, that we deal with. However, so suppose we have to analyze a theory such as PA. A priori, uh, uh, at first, we don't have any ordering along which to iterate. We don't know where to start, right? How do we extend it? So uh, the traditional proof theory, uh, let's say, uh, did it as follows. They say, okay, here is this nice ordering epsilon naught uh, defined by counter normal forms, ordinal notations uh, defined by counter normal forms, consider it consider ordinals defined uh, by counter normal forms, do whatever we need with them, and then the result tells you, okay, then uh, for this specific ordinal notation, everything works. Uh, so in uh, my approach here, uh, we do it <laughs> in a sense in a reverse order. We don't start with an a priori given ordering, Instead, we start with this uh, notion of reflection algebra. Mm. We consider uh, completely abstract general structures and uh, given by uh, certain operations related to our reflection principles. Then we say, okay, look at this algebra 
and establish some of its properties. We establish some of its properties. One of them is, uh, as I said, this uh, adequacy of this reflection calculus, decidability, blah, blah, so certain kind of, you can say, probability logic study of it. And then we look at this uh, variable free formulas and uh, formulas. And discover uh, that this structure, in fact, looks like an ordering, like a well ordering, and we can even show that it is isomorphic to epsilon. We, if we were not interested in counter normal forms, for example, we could have said that, okay, whatever, we know that it is a well ordering and we are satisfied. It's a recursive well ordering. Why it is recursive? Because the system RC0 is decidable. As I said, it is a decidable, polytime decidable. So in fact, uh, the well ordering that we defined here by less than zero, this one, is a polytime decidable well ordering on the set of words in the alphabet N. So that's, uh, that's the ordering we extracted from, from the structure of our algebra. And then we say, okay, why don't we use this particular ordering uh, for proof theoretic analysis? Uh, and then we say, okay, very well. So what we obtain uh, is this theorem stated here. I didn't talk about it, but your question led me to it. So uh, consider this particular ordering that we deal with. And iterate uh, consider any element alpha, any word alpha, and then it turns out that this word, its interpretation in in the uh, in the algebra that we deal with, the sequence of reflection, the theory defined by uh, alpha alpha reflection, you can say, over over E A, will be the same, will be equivalent for pi n plus one sentences to the theory Rn iterated alpha times, where alpha now is understood as the uh, element of that well ordering W. So there is a natural relation between well ordering W and the algebra, and well ordering W is just another way of looking at epsilon naught. So we relate in this way uh, logical theories extended by alpha, and that leads, leads us to this relation by, by Schmel, which is about P8 itself, if you like. But this is much more, this theorem is much more refined, I would say, relation, because it uh, in one go tells you about the proof theoretic strength of various systems composed of various. Uh, reflection operators. So that's how it, how it uh, in fact um, works in this approach. So uh, the ordinal, the upshot, uh, the conclusion is that the ordinal notation system that we deal with here, it came from our specific way of looking at this algebra of series from this reflection algebra. And that's it. Then we apply to it on the one hand, Turing's idea, and on the other hand, ideas uh, from probability logic, and it all, all came together into this uh, analysis of P8. So that's how it uh, how it actually works.